Bill Ottman is the creator of Minds.com. And Minds is a social media platform that has over 6 million people on it. Bill's also been featured on the Joe Rogan experience. And in this conversation, we spoke about that experience. And we spoke about his thoughts on Lex Friedman and Elon Musk. We spoke about the importance of challenges and why Elon buying Twitter was a good thing. There's a lot of gold in this conversation. I'm really grateful for Bill for spending his time to sit down with me for an hour. And I'm really excited to bring this conversation to you. This conversation is presented to you by My First Million. My First Million is a podcast where two entrepreneurs talk about the latest in technology and business. And they are a podcast where I go to for the latest, if I'm trying to figure out what's going on with Twitter, what's going on with Sam Bankman fried you should check out My First Million wherever you listen to podcasts. And the link for that is down below. Thank you so much for listening. And this is my conversation with Bill Ottman. Bill, I'm so excited to have you on today. I, when people reach out to me normally, I tend to not accept them on the podcast because I'm not genuinely interested in talking to a lot of the people that reach out. And it's crazy how many do. But you reached out and I was like, wow, based on everything that's going on, based on everything I'm interested in, I can't wait to talk to you today. So thank you so much for coming here, Bill. Thanks for having me, man. So I'd love to start with Lex Friedman and Kanye West. And the reason why I want to start with that is because I found such value out of that conversation, Lex and Kanye talking to each other, and I posted about it on Instagram, and I posted about it on Twitter saying, this was one of the most important conversations that I've listened to in a long, long time, and I highly recommend other people listen to it as well. But what happened to me was really interesting in that the pushback that I got from posting that was people saying, I haven't listened to this, but do you really think someone like Kanye West should have that big of a platform? And I was just fascinated by that response to something that I thought was so important to me. And I thought you, as the creator of Minds.com and somebody who's been so entrenched in the free speech world, would have some incredible insights about that. I agree. That was an amazing conversation. And, you know, it's funny that the person, or at least one of the people who criticized you hadn't watched it. I feel like that's a common trend. (laughs) You know, people have this judgment of a controversial conversation before even diving in. People were doing that a lot about the Dave Chappelle special, you know, the calling it transphobic, despite the fact that it was this heart wrenching story about a, a trans woman who opened for him and actually uh, committed suicide. And it was like a tragedy. And so, yeah, it's like, there is no, they're the best conversations, the controversial ones. So, and society needs that to happen. If it doesn't happen, we're just gonna keep splitting. Yeah, why do you think that the initial inclination today is when something controversial happens for us to say, I don't want to hear that. Mm. I mean, it's, it, they're hard conversations. There's, there's yeah. some ugliness that can pop up. Mm. I think that that's the understandable aspect of people's resistance to free speech because it's hard to confront that ugly side of humanity. Um, but it's necessary and it's the only way to heal, actually. So, I mean, I think that it's it's probably reflective of people not wanting to deal with their own self on a certain level. Um, Because I mean, it's, they're they're just ideas like, Mm -hmm. and conversations are way better than violence. So you kind of have to pick, to be honest. It's like, we either talk through the issues or things are probably going to escalate into a worse place. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, I mean, we've, I'm really close friends with Daryl Davis, who you might know, who is just a hero. And you know, this is proven. Like, Who's Daryl Davis? Daryl Davis who is a um, black musician who has helped over 200 members of the KKK leave the KKK mm. just by befriending them. 
And it's like, oh, be nice to people who are, who are jerks and maybe, yeah, you have to be. Mm. Like if you, if you can't show empathy to the worst people in the world, they're never gonna change. And like, there have been tons of studies on this. There's just a huge study that came out of Stanford showing how empathy on social media is the most effective towards um, reducing xenophobia. Mm. And that was compared, so they basically tried three different things, empathy, uh, comedy, and like basically trying to convince people aggressively mm. and trying to convince people aggressively came in last. So that's, which makes sense. What, you don't want to listen to people who are trying to convince you too hard. There, it's, it's like the backfire effect. Sam Harris has, has uh, written, has done research on that. Yeah, and it, it's funny that it's like comedy in that sense is almost like the way in which people can start to understand the other side. Like, and it can almost be the road that leads to the caring about people and the empathy is like comedy is in the middle of that. And mm. I've never thought about it from that perspective before, where in order for somebody to change their mind, maybe they first need to laugh about it or consider the possibility of why are they laughing? What's going on there? So it's an interesting insight. Yeah. Oh, I mean, if you're laughing, you're, you're in a good place. Like we, I just, I'm, I'm, I don't understand why people are so, cause laughing feels so good. Yeah. So, and, and people feel like guilty about laughing about dark things. Sometimes. Yeah. But I mean, and so many comics say this, that they're using it as their own therapy mm -hmm. to just deal with their childhood or whatever kind of crazy stuff has happened in their life. When did free speech become an important part of your own life? Always. I mean, as soon as I realized that it was even a debate, I was weirded out, you know, that there was this resistance to it. And then I sort of saw the landscape of like the top hundred sites on the internet and how you know, some of them seem to allow free expression and others don't and like, why? And, and what's the benefit to any site by censorship? Mm. Um, because aren't they just losing a potential audience? That's kind of how I always considered it. And you're seeing this now on Twitter, like, you know that Elon is like, well, I would like those active users, you know, all those people who were banned, to, you know, that's going to be good for business probably. I mean, when you politic, when your business becomes politically biased, how can that, I mean, yes, some advertisers are kind of conscious of this, but ultimately don't you want to be selling your product to the widest range of people? Mm. So you bring up Elon and Elon bought Twitter recently and has recently instated, reinstated a bunch of people that he, that Twitter had previously taken off. So give me your perspective on Elon and what he's done with Twitter. So yeah, he started the process of unbanning some people. He's done some high profile unbans like Babylon B and, um, you know, Trump mm -hmm. and Project Veritas and places, controversial places like that. Um, and now he has said that he's going to do like a general amnesty where everybody who was banned as long as it wasn't for anything illegal or like malicious spam is going to be let back. And that's where we're coming from essentially. Like that's, that's where our policy is like, as long as you're not attacking the network with spam or doing anything illegal, like we want you to have a platform to communicate whether you're a good person or a bad person, because if you're a good person, great. If you're a bad person, well, you still need a community. Otherwise, you're just going to become a worse person. Mm. Um, and I think, yeah, I think it's good. He hasn't done everything that he said, but it, you know, like open sourcing the algorithm, encrypting the messages, you know, but it's, it's been like a few weeks. So I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt for a while. But, you know, there's sort of a handful of principles that, with transparency, privacy, free expression, decentralization, that I think he really needs to get aggressive on. Mm. And we'll see. I, I know that he has very smart people 
there working with him who are well aware of decentralization and and transparency. And he's also made crazy statements recently about how he's going to release all the information about the Hunter Biden corruption and everything that went on around. Oh my God. Like he's just like ranting on uh, about what he's going to do. It's such a fascinating strategy. Yeah. Like we've never seen that out of a tech CEO. Yeah. For, for big tech. A hundred percent. And I'm curious from your perspective as somebody who is, you're trying to do all a lot of the things that Elon is doing. Does well, he's I would I would invert it. He's trying to do a lot of the, the things, things that we're doing. Right. So, and he hasn't done them yet. And he has a you know much larger platform. Right. <laughs> and so what I'm curious about is from your perspective, does it are you inclined to like almost argue against Twitter because you have your own thing? And mm. are you biased in that way of being like, no, we did it first? And, and how do you think about that? No, yeah, I definitely don't. I, I try, it's not, social media is not a zero sum game. Yeah. It's, uh, there's so much room for so many people to be successful. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, a general philosophy that I hold in life, just w whatever industry, there's, there's so much room for so many successful companies yes. and individuals. And, you know, so whatever market you're in, you know, getting, you know, into this scarcity mentality with, the competition makes absolutely no sense. Um, I think that it is a huge benefit for the world. The more free speech there is, the more transparency. So, you know, I, if anything, just want to constructively give feedback to Twitter. I hope I would love to work with them, yeah. you know, and collaborate. And because that's the future that we're trying to create, where it's not just these monolithic networks that control everything about you. And it's actually the creators and the users own their identity, their content, their social, their following. Mm. Cause it's, it's just the wrong power dynamic where these networks actually own your followers. So if they, you know, if they boot you off or something happens, then you lose everything that you worked like a decade for. Mm. And I've seen that happen where people, you know, work for a decade building up a following on like YouTube and then so they get banned for, they don't even know why and they just lost everything that they built. So, you know, the future some more sovereign tech is going to enable people to control that data. Okay, so for those unfamiliar, what is minds.com and, and take us through like the building and starting of this project. So yeah, minds is a social media app that feels similar to like Twitter, but it is fully open source, meaning that all of the blueprints, all of the code are publicly available for anyone to take. They can make their own app. There are people who have taken our code and made their own companies and, um, and apps. So they forked us. We are, you know, everything is encrypted. So like, I don't want access to your conversations. That's just weird. I don't know why all these companies insist on doing that. Well, I do know why actually, because they get data and they can target you with ads mm. <laughs> basically um, and surveil for more nefarious purposes in certain circumstances. But then we have, we're, we're very focused on the uh, monetization for creators. We have rev share programs with creators. We um, have a huge crypto integration and yeah, it's really just about, you know, looking at first principles of transparency, privacy, and putting power into users' hands. And when you go down that rabbit hole, you eventually see, you, you eventually just start thinking about the infrastructure of the internet and you kind of this web two to web three and web five, there's all these kind of different versions of it. Um, but at the end of the day, and I know this is a little bit techie, for, but people are taking control over their keys. Hmm. So in what does that mean? So, Anyone who's done anything with Bitcoin or crypto knows that you have a wallet. So this wallet basically has a key pair, a public key, which is where people send stuff, and a private key, which is your password, essentially, to your wallet. And so for encrypted messages, it works the same way. People send messages to your public key, and your private key is what can decrypt all of those messages. So this principle is going to be applied to social media, where everyone's identity has this key pair associated with it, and you control that, not the network. So you're the only one with the private key. You're the only one who can access that account 
and um, move it around from network to network. So um, yeah, I think that what we're going to see hopefully is that big networks start to participate in this more decentralized world. So it'll kind of be like a hybrid between web 2.0 and web three where, you know, Twitter's still going to exist. Like, I don't think we're going to go back to a world where, you know, like MySpace and Friendster and all that stuff that kind of evaporated. I don't think that's going to happen. I, I, I don't think that, uh, they're too embedded in, in the infrastructure of everything, you know, hap, most people who create an app are using like Facebook API to log in with Facebook. And so everyone's dependent on them mm. so much that I don't really see them going anywhere. That's why what's happening with Twitter is great because it's really showing that change can happen within big tech. Like this is the first time it's always for the past 10 years, we've been building this company. It's always been like, you know, us and a handful of other alternative social media apps versus big tech. Yeah. But now it's like, oh, there's a there's a dark horse within big tech mm. that is actually starting to think about these ideas. And I know that Elon can be polarizing in a, in a certain degree and he's not perfect, but I'm just I'm glad at least these conversations are happening at a high level. It feels like someone's on your side for the first time. Yeah. What have you noticed as somebody who's paid close attention to social media and social networks in general? What has been the biggest problem from your perspective and what is Minds trying to do to help solve it? I think the biggest problem is the unbalanced power dynamic where the networks control everything about you and your identity and your followers and your reach and you know all of the algorithmic censorship that we're seeing, shadow banning, or even just regular algorithmic demotion. I mean, on, for instance, on Facebook, like a decade ago, you could reach a lot of people. Yeah. If you had a page with like 100,000 followers or something, you were getting crazy traffic. Mm. And now when you post on Facebook, only like a couple percent of your own followers are even seeing your posts. So they started messing with the news feed where it wasn't this basic, like I publish you subscribe to me so you see my stuff. And so when they started interfering in that and they started basically designing your news feed in a way that was of interest to them, you know. But th isn't, isn't it of interest to you as well? Because the reason why you're getting videos on your For You page on TikTok, let's say, mm -hmm. is because you are inclined to like that content. I'm not, we're, I'm definitely not anti-algorithm. We mm. even have alternative feeds where you can opt into stuff like that. Yeah. But I do think that the default, I think that the setting should be in the user's control. There's really, and by default. Yeah. Because what's happening, like on Instagram, for instance, now, your whole news feed is like, these viral videos that you're like, yeah, it's like of interest. You know, I'll see guitar videos of like some sick guitar players. I'm like, okay, that's awesome. But I don't know who this person, I'm not subscribed to them. I, and so you, they're feeding you all this. It's like your newsfeed is now an explore feed. Yeah. And you're not even seeing your friends anymore. And it, and I know that they say, oh yeah, you can, you know, go, but you can change the setting. But I think that that default is a really important thing for people to have control over. Um, and there's also no way to wipe the data because it gets super weird at a certain point when, what do you mean wipe the data? Well, wipe all of the historical data that they have about your behavior. Gotcha. Because that's what they, you know, share with intelligence agencies and, um, we don't exactly know everything that they do with it. So yeah, I'm not against like good recommendations can be great. Mm -hmm. It's not, and I don't want to be the, uh, you know, grump about, <laughs> <laughs> about like crazy recommendations that T you, know, you can learn a lot from those feeds. So it's, it's more so about consent mm. and about the, you know, taking something away. Like what's the con I know that look at the end of the day, when you sign certain terms of service, you're pretty much giving away all rights from the get go. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that it, you you would think that when you build up a following, like those people can actually see your stuff, but it's really changing. So now, 
you know, for instance, YouTube doesn't even care about subscribers nearly as much. It's more like watch time. And so if you have really high watch time, you might not, you might have a small YouTube channel, but if you're getting super high watch time, you might be posting videos with, you know, many thousands of views just, and there's, there's good things about that too. Um, so I guess ultimately there, there are benefits and consequences because there's a lot of bias that can come into play when the algorithm, you know, if we don't know what it's doing, then it could be punishing anybody. We, you know, it could be punishing people politically. It could be punishing people based on all different types of interests that we don't even know about. So I just feel like that needs to be a level playing field so that people know what they're actually dealing with. Um, and because then, you know, then you can be confident to invest your time in that platform. I, it, cause I've just seen so many people's businesses get destroyed by the algorithm. Mm. And that's just really sad to watch. I think what you're doing is creating a world that's more transparent. And if you look at how history has progressed, it's generally in line with a more transparent world, right? Like if you look at the information that we're getting today, it's much better than the information that people were getting a hundred years ago. And I'm sure a hundred years from now, it'll be a more transparent and open world. So it seems like only natural that the world will go in this direction. But it sometimes probably can feel difficult when you're in the trenches of like getting to the next place, mm. right? Like, because you're sitting there one day to one week to one month and you're like, nothing's changed in, in the case of most months, not when Elon buys Twitter, let's say, but most months it's just like, all right, like we're improving a little bit. But what you've, you can tap into is you can see that Minds has grown. I remember listening to one podcast you were in, it was like, it was at a million people using Minds and a million um, users. And then it was like 6 million today. And, and that's a growth and you can track, okay, people are more interested in this service today or in this moment. So what's it been like to be the boots on the ground of seeing the subscriber base grow of Minds in general? Yeah, I mean, I think that culture is generally becoming more interested in these ideas. I mean, you know, a major tech company is basically adopting a lot of the principles that we've been taught. So that's very validating yeah. and it, it makes me feel like we're on the right track. Also, we're seeing great growth as well. So, I mean, it's hard though, because since we're not willing to use a lot of the dirty surveillance tricks that big tech used, just reaching in into everyone's contact book, following you across you know, what you're doing in your browser, browser fingerprint, like there's so many dirty tricks that can be used to grow kind of these dark growth ha hacks. So that's challenging because, so, cause there's a, there's a conflict between, you know, ma maximizing growth means that you're going to inevitably be confronted with the decision to a uh, abuse your users mm. essentially. And this is kind of the decision that places like Facebook have made. They've, they've just said, look, we're going all in on surveillance and we're just going to grow and that we're making that decision. And, you know, yeah, I mean, people, I, I just think people need to be aware of the apps that they're using and, um, and give energy to apps that they feel like are, making the world the world that they want to live in because we live on our phones. I mean, we're literally checking apps hundreds of times a day. So all of those taps are just like, think of it like feeding an organism. Mm -hmm. You basically are, and you're just sitting there and you're like, all the attention is just these streams of energy and metrics that are going to these companies. And that is empowering those companies. Those companies are, are growing on those metrics. They're raising money on those metrics. They're, um, that's what's, you know, you feed what you do. Um, and there are alternatives now. And so it's such an easy decision. Like if you're going to tap, if you if you open your phone, you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to search something, you know, do you need to use Google or, you know, can you use DuckDuckGo or do you need to use uh, Safari or can you use Brave or, you know, another open source browser. And like those tiny moves completely change the power dynamic on the internet over time. So that's kind of what I got obsessed with is putting your energy towards 
the companies that you want to see succeed mm. because it's easy to like believe in this stuff and say, oh yeah, that's messed up that, you know, Google is, you know, sharing everything with the NSA or whatever the scandal of the day is with big tech. Um, but if you keep feeding them, it's kind of like, all right, well, I guess you don't care that much. But oh, but again, it's this, it's not a judgment on anybody. Most people aren't even aware that there's another option. Yeah. Aware there's another option. Also, a lot of people aren't aware what big tech is doing wrong. Mm -hmm. So can you like lay out for somebody who is like, why should I use DuckDuckGo when it's easier to use Google? What's the, what's the pitch to that person to explain to them like from zero to one, why should they be even using something else? I mean, I, I do compare it to buying food. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the whole organic local kind of movement has is completely blown up. It's mainstream now. People are conscious of where they're getting their food. They want not only because it's healthy for them, but it's, you know, not supporting factory farms and just madness. And so I think the analogy is the same with tech really. It's like, do you um do you want to support companies that are just, you know, tick look look at TikTok right now most viral app in the world. The one thing I like about TikTok actually is that it proved that a new app can come out and completely dominate. Mm. You know, in the last five, where was TikTok five years ago? It's like, yeah. that's crazy that, you know, before it was like, wow, are, is this it? Is it going to be Facebook and Google forever? And then TikTok comes. So I think it's beautiful that they proved that that can change, but Unfortunately, it was sort of the wrong app for it to happen to because they're spying on everybody like grotesquely. And, you know, we don't know what's going on with the relationship with China. There was just a, a big piece that came out showing that they're actually like physically tracking people in the U.S. And, you know, if you think about and, you know, it's in terms of how much of that is exactly true, I don't know. But. If you were an authoritarian country, what would be a better weapon against your enemy than a super fun, cute video app that absolutely is, you know, streaming you data from, you know, the whole population of that country? I mean, it sort of sounds like an authoritarian's dream. So, you know, why? But, you know, that, that's the tension. It's like, it's so fun and it's also spawning all this creativity. So it's like this very gray area. How do you take the best aspects of TikTok for yourself in minds and, and build that into your platform? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the functionality in TikTok, Instagram, I mean, there's like brilliant designers and developers at these companies. It's like so many amazing innovations have come out of them. You know, I remember when stories got stolen by, it's not stolen, but like, I think of that as, as a creative uh, process. Like all of these companies are sort of realizing that this is a really good feature. It's like chat. I mean, you just, it, it becomes ubiquitous. So, but that's the funny thing that social media apps are all kind of becoming the same. Mm. You know, now YouTube has a news feed. People are posting photos on YouTube. Uh, Instagram, you know, with stories and reels, like uh, taking that from TikTok and they all have chat. So it's like, well, wait a second. I have these five different apps and they're all basically the same thing with like slight differences. But what that says is that, you know, this is the functionality that people want. I mean, it works and it's very efficient for communicating. So that's, you know, when you use Minds, it feels pretty similar to um, to those apps. And that's, that's kind of the goal. Like, let's take the good technology and the good communication mechanisms, but build it in a more ethical way where the user is in control. It is interesting how all social media platforms are inherently very similar, but they each develop its, their own culture in a mm. way. So it's like Twitter, you go for ideas, Instagram, maybe aesthetics. And I'm curious from your perspective, what do you want minds to be known for? I think it's much more so where you really feel more comfortable to speak your mind. Mm. Um, I think people hold back a lot on social media. How typically. often, how often do you hear someone say, Oh, this is for the group chat only. This isn't for public consumption. Right. That's a scary world we're living in 
where people believe that they can't really speak their mind. Well, and they can't a lot on a lot of these apps because they might get banned if they say it. So, and that's on both sides of the spectrum. You know, sure. I don't come at this politically. I'm, I'm homeless politically. And, um, you know, people on the left and the right have been deplatformed f- from big tech. It's not, you know, oh, it's sort of a uh, common thing for people to say, oh, there's all this right wing bias in big tech, which I think is generally true. But there are definitely um, left wing groups that have been targeted as well for, you know, typically more anti-establishment on both sides. Um, but... Yeah, I think that that chilling effect is the creepiest thing in the world is, you know, because that's the purpose of social media is to express yourself. So when you can't fully express yourself and that's kind of what Instagram represents is and some people are totally authentic on Instagram and don't hold back. So it's not everybody. But, you know, this very curated version of yourself, which again, I'm not judging, like people have the right to curate whatever they want. That's the whole point. But when you are actually scared of social backlash, that that's just sad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I spoke to someone recently. How old are you? I'm 37. 37. Okay. So I spoke to someone who told me that they, in their group chat, somebody said, if you vote for this person, then I'm not going to be your friend. And the person said, oh, well, I'm going to go along with that because I want to be friends with this person. But was the world always like this, where people wouldn't be friends with other people because they were voting for somebody else? Like That seems like a pretty crazy extreme. And then for someone to feel so inclined to pretend that they were voting for that person just so that they could be friends with someone else seemed to me like a dystopian world. Mm. Yeah. I think it's reached new levels. I can remember dinner table debates at my, you know, watching my parents and my uncles and aunts like arguing over politics when I was younger. And now people just like storm off Mm. from the table. And it's like not in, you know, there's people don't even want to hang out as much. And I think that because of the personality cult of Trump, um, and he is like such a polarizing person that it's not even as much about politics anymore. It's about specific personalities. Like people don't like people. Yeah. They don't like Trump's policies, but more so they think that he is a, just like narcissist and a crook type thing. And it gets, and when 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 you get into the personality um, conflict, that's a much more intense emotion that people feel. It's deeper. Mm. And when you're discussing ideas, people can say, "Oh, that idea is better than this idea," or "I think this idea is right rather than that idea." But when you get into people, it's almost like that person is bad. Therefore, all the ideas that that person has are bad, and therefore, I hate that person. When you attack a person. It, it gets to a deeper human mm-hmm. function in the brain, body, and mind than ideas do. Yeah. And it's sad because anyone can change. Mm. And like even Trump, and not that it would be easy. And, you know, if you, so if you look at Daryl's work, some of the KKK members that he would talk to, and I've, I've talked to some of them as well, and it takes time. Like some of these conversations that he has with, you know, he'll have emails going back and forth for years before, you know, he'll gain some ground because his whole strategy, and this is reflective in the research is like, you can't push too hard. You just have to be there to like, listen to them and not, you know, have your agenda so much. And I think that you notice in a lot of Trump's interviews is like, they usually go better when people aren't you know, being confrontated, you know, it's, oh, wait a second. When people are nicer, it's going to go better. And I think that people are just so impatient and they're not willing to have the long conversations that are necessary, even though that is exactly the thing that would potentially convince someone like Trump to change his mind on certain topics. So I think that there, you know, no one's innocent Mm -hmm. on this, like avoid, because avoiding the conversation isn't going to fix anything. Guess what? The 
you know, whole MAGA thing exists. You're not going to change that. So you, you're, the only option is to either confront it or just like cry about it. Mm. And confront it could just be listening to what that person. That's has the to thing. Say. Yeah, that's what I mean by by confront. It's it's like still be kind. Like you have to be kind in the pro, in the process of confronting. Otherwise, you're going to have no success. What got you on the path to understanding people's ideas and or trying to understand people's ideas and listening? And it seems like from talking to you and listening to you, you're at peace. It seems like. And maybe you're trying to change certain things, but it feels like, I really do feel a sense of like, you're okay with whatever happens and you want to hear people out and you're at peace with yourself. How did you get to that place? That's, I'm not always at that place. Right, that's fair. <laughs> but, that, but that is the place that I feel the most um, calm and, you know, if, because that is success, that place. Yes. So if you can constantly be in that place, then you've already won in a, in a certain degree. So, you know, the, the whole battle, like, let's get out of that. And I, yeah, I think that the expectations are um, of other people in a, in a specific conversation are, um, you know, doomed. Like, that, mm -hmm. that's the whole, what, have you heard of the four agreements? Of course. So, One of my favorite I mean, books. that changed the game for me. The and, Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. Everyone should yeah. watch, listen to that book as many times as you can, read it. It's an incredible book. Yeah. And the one that always stuck with me is just, you know, not having expectations of, mm. of other people. And because it's just, it's, it's destined for failure. And not that you, and, like, why not just have no expectations so that you can be pleasantly surprised? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it was funny when we started this conversation, I asked you, what would be a win? And you said, we've already won. That is, in essence, being at peace because you're comfortable with whatever happening and understanding that just being in the present moment is the win. Yeah, and there's this whole meme going on now that is sort of like, you know, your ideology is causing me harm. Mm. There's the, a, a lot of the cultural debate is sort of saying that, you know, hate speech, misinformation, all of this information is actually, you know, putting people at risk. Phys and, and, and some of these outlet, media outlets and individuals will, will even say physical risk. And this is just not true. It's not true that words are violence. Mm. That doesn't mean that words can't hurt. It doesn't mean that words can't potentially lead to, you know, certain negative consequences, but words are not violence. Mm. And the fact that people are trying to make that a thing, it, despite no evidence of it, is, is just really dangerous because like, what world are you bringing in to being. Mm -hmm. You're bringing in a, a, a world where if people hear something that's even the slightest, in this, to the slightest degree to offensive, you know, they're just going to peace out mm -hmm. from, and, and just avoid the conversation. And so. not hear each other. Yeah. And that's the important part. It's like, in order to change or have people change their minds or opinions, we need to hear each other. We need to speak to each other. We need to understand why does Kanye West think the things that he does? What if I approached him with love and empathy and trying to understand him, what would happen? What would, what would his perspective be? How would he explain himself? Not, I don't want to hear you, la la la. That, that doesn't actually improve the world and improve each other. And I hope that Lex and Kanye keep talking. Yeah. You know, they should do a round two. Cause you know, as you could see with that interview, it takes time. Like you're not going to win every battle um, and it's going to be a roller coaster of back and forth. Like you feel like you made progress, but then, oh, okay, you know, we're, <laughs> we're back here again. But I, th the mental health aspect of all of this honestly needs to be top of mind because think about how differently you perceive all the hate speech and, um, you know, just like horrible perspectives of people in the world when you think of it through the, through the lens of like, you know, racism versus looking through it as a mental health problem. Mm. Like racists are mentally ill. Mm. That's a fact. So, and people who are mentally ill are, 
you know, spouting off all of this, anti- whatever it is. But when you think about it through the lens of like, okay, these people need help. I just, it, that completely reframes the whole thing for me. So I think of social media almost like a, you know, therapy session. And we actually are going to be partnering with big therapy groups. And this is why companies like uh, BetterHelp and uh, Talkspace are blowing up because, and they should, because they're providing a hugely important service so that people can get digital therapy. And so, you know, our vision long term would be rather than having all these content moderators who are just like, ban, 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 like reach out, like have people who are proactively reaching out to these types of people. And if they want to talk, let them talk. But I mean, yeah, I, I, I just, you could see someone that you absolutely hate, but then when you start thinking about mental health, you slightly, it, it doesn't seem the same anymore. Why do you think mental health problems have been on the rise with social media apps? Mental health what? Mental health issues oh. have been on the rise with social media apps. Yeah. It seems almost like a one-to-one correlation, and that doesn't mean mm. causation, but people who ingest a lot of social media content tend to feel mentally disturbed or depressed. It's a very common narrative. If you just are in the feed nonstop, it makes you upset. Mm. I don't think mm. we've we've really pinpointed why exactly that is. And I'm curious from your perspective. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the funny thing. It's, it's, it's really both. Like it can be a source of therapy for like communicating with other people, but it can also cause you to kind of go into these dark places. Yeah. But so there's the addiction aspect of it, which, you know, you just feel horrible about, your, horrible about yourself when you've, you know, refreshed your feed too many times in a day. You know, like we all know that it's not a good thing to be doing. You're, un- you're standing in line waiting for coffee. You know, y- y- muscle memory kicks in. You're like, am I even controlling my body? Like I cannot stop myself from refreshing this feed right now. Um, so that is scary. That's something that we all need to deal with in our own way. Um, but then, yeah, j- like comparing yourself to other people, you know, you, w- we now have a uh, direct line into the most wealthy and successful people's lives. We, they're literally live streaming half the day. So you can pretty much just live with them. And it's, uh, it's hard to resist doing that. And so it makes you realize what you don't have. But again, it's a tool. I, and I, I ultimately think the tool's not going away. Mm-hmm. So we just have to change the tool because there's no, there's no going back. Mm. I love how when I looked at the Minds feed, I saw one post that was just like, go outside or like, this is a reminder to go. I was like, that's such a a nice thing to post. We just sent out one of these. Yeah, we sent that prompt out. So we just launched this new tool, uh, this new feature called Supermind, Mm. which is a way for users to offer, send each other offers to reply to them. So I could send you an offer for like 50 bucks to reply to my post. Oh, wow. Um, and so you can target like, you know, cause a lot of bigger creators don't have enough time to respond to everybody. So this is a way for, you know, their fa- fans to basically support a creator and, but also get direct engagement with that creator. Wow. Yeah. We, we, we gotta get you cool. going on it. Um, but we have been doing these community wide offers. So we'll send everybody an offer of like five or 10 tokens. A token gets you views. You mm-hmm. can use tokens on mines to boost your content and get more views. Um, so we sent a prompt, you know, go outside and take a picture of the sky. And we just sent it to like, you know, a hundred thousand people. Oh my God. So like crowdsourcing that type of content, getting people to, uh, go outside for a second. You know, I just think it's funny doing like weird stuff like that. Just like, dude, put your phone, like we've sent notifications out that are like, put your phone down and like, (laughs) Get off minds right now. <laughs> That's what I say. I say sometimes on this podcast, stop listening to me, listen mm-hmm. to yourself for one moment and see how that feels. See how it feels to just sit with yourself. Do you have any experience with meditation or anything like that? Yeah. Yeah. Tell, tell me about I mean, it. I haven't studied it that much, but I do it a lot. Mm-hmm. I, I, probably, I probably meditate for a good 10 minutes a day. 10 minutes a day. Yeah. When did you start doing that? Why did you start doing it? Um, I started doing it in college, so I've been doing it for a long time, but you know, I also walk and so, but I don't know how you define it. Some people wouldn't count walking as meditation, but 
I think I do count it. It, de- it depends how disciplined you're being with your thoughts. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, because it's ultimately breath. And have you, have you ever heard of uh, the book Breath by James Nestor? Yeah, I've heard of it. Game changing book. I've never um, actually read it, but. Well, just, you know, the world breathes improperly. Yeah. So to think that the, I mean, and it's correlated to anxiety and depression and all of this, uh, these negative health consequences. So meditation to me is just breath, focusing on breath. And when you focus on breath, your life just gets better. Yeah. If you, in, like physically, your body gets better, but also mental clarity and that enables you to be more successful with everything that you're doing. So yeah, t- what about you? I, I love meditating. Medi- I started doing it in 2019, late 2019 and it changed my life. And it's part of the reason why this podcast exists because I started to ask myself, what, what are the beliefs that I'm holding? Why are these beliefs, what's going on here? How did I get this belief? Why am I doing this action? And that just questioning myself with myself, it almost became therapy. And I was like, wow, this is pretty incredible. So mm-hmm. started with 20 minutes a day in the morning, first thing before checking phone. And then it slowly became 20 minutes in the morning and night. And then it became an hour in the morning. And I was like, oh my God, I know I want to start a podcast because I'm talking to people every day and I'm enjoying it. So yeah, it's been incredibly beneficial. I know also you you did a 100 burpee challenge. This was a while oh, ago. Oh yeah, I love the challenges, man. The challenges, doing a challenge with somebody or a group can absolutely change your life. What was, what have been the most impactful I've done, yeah, I've challenges? done a few. Um, the 100 burpee was, my, was the original, which I did with a group of like 10 guys, my brother, my couple, few of my best friends. 100 burpees a day for 100 days. Love it. Um, and burpees are just amazing because they just get everything and they, you know, get your heart going. You know, I, my, I'm, I just avoid cardio. So doing that was, it was a huge test. And it was also, it was not just 100 burpees a day, it was for time. Mm. So it's just, you can, you can bust it out in like, you know, under 10 minutes. Um, some of the savages in our group would do it in like four. I was just like, okay, you're, you're, something's wrong with you. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I had never, that, I got into the best shape of my life just doing that only. Wow. And so it's like 10 minutes a day. Wait a second. Like there's no excuse. So then we did um, 200 push ups a day which was good too, that was fun. And now like I'm not doing a challenge specifically, but I just have a friend that we are, you know, on a path to a thousand pushups in a day. Wow. We're at 550. Nice. Um, And just, but like having someone there with you for accountability, it's the only way for me. I I can't do it alone. Yeah, and I think that's, such an important piece. Whenever I want to make a change in my life, I tweet it out because I'm saying mm-hmm. to myself, okay, these people are keeping me responsible in a way. Mm-hmm. And so that's been a, a helpful way just to have accountability. And it's like, if you're, if you're posting about it on social media, you are like letting the world know this is what I'm hold, holding myself accountable to. So that's been beneficial for me. Yeah, I think a lot of, I, I, I use social media like that as well. And I think that it's easy to, that's the other thing. Like people are really just using the posting as even like a journal. Yeah. And so that's the other odd thing about getting pissed about stuff on social media is like, don't pay attention to it. Mm. I mean, but then comes in, you know, the ideology that, oh no, 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 those people are doing real world harm. Mm-hmm. And so I need to do something about it. And that, that, that's where the kind of like the moral justification comes in for, you know, building up that mob to get rid of that person. And I'm not like, look, the battlefield of ideas is open season. Like you, anyone has the right to go after anyone and debate that should happen. But when you start saying that, you know, their ideas don't have a right to exist on the internet because, you know, you're offended by them. It's like, look, if you had a shred of evidence or data that showed that what you're saying is true, okay, bring it to the table. I've looked, we just wrote a huge, you know, 80 page uh, research paper with multiple PhDs, bringing together all of the research around censorship. It's not there. 
but um yeah so the reality is that those ideas are going to exist and you know don't don't take them away you, like social media companies don't have better content policy than the first amendment i mean the first amendment in the legal case history that comes with it over centuries is like an amazing body of information and precedent. I mean, this is like the U S is, you know, despite all of our problems is where most people in the world want to come because they see the value in freedom. Mm. And so a social media company's content policy and a little team of lawyers and people who are getting upset about content online, they're not smarter than hundreds of years of U S case history and, you know, proof that basically free speech creates healthy societies, even mm -hmm. if, even though there's ugliness that comes with it. So, um, I, yeah, I'm trying to get that point across because, and I think that the data around it really matters because it's such an emotional argument. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, they're saying things that are really making me feel uncomfortable. Um, but you should know that if you try to ban them, then it's probably going to make them go and become a worse person and go into some little echo chamber on some other little app. And it's, it might even make them actually accelerate into something much more dangerous. Yeah. Well, you put it so beautifully when you said the ugliness of ignorant ideas is beautiful compared to the horror of everyone's mouth soon shut. That's a beautifully way to put it. And it got a lot of love on minds for the reason that it hit, I'm sure, so deeply into the idea that we need to hear each other speak and we need to be able to speak in order to move forward. Yeah, and the, the sense of satisfaction that you get when you're talking to someone and you feel like you've, you know, you're gaining a little bit of ground over time. Like I have a like, long history with my dad. When I came back out of college, I was just like Mr. Holier than thou trying to convince him that, you know, all of his ideas were wrong about, you know, politics and everything. And I was just so aggressive yeah. and it just never processed. But then, you know, over time, I just let go, accepted him for who, who he was. And I'm not kidding. Like now he's like, he's further out than me on all of this, <laughs> like, you know, internet freedom stuff. So it's like, it like, we, I have some of my own stories now with seeing people change by not even trying, mm. but you are trying still, but you're just letting them do their own work and letting them come to the ideas on their own. It's just like, it's honestly just a basic persuasion technique, not to, not to make it like sound manipulative or anything, but if you want to persuade someone, you actually don't try to persuade them and well, you subtly let them move. Yeah. And you also embody the thing you're trying to persuade yourself. When, if your dad sees you using Brave or using DuckDuckGo, he'll be like, oh, that's interesting. Why is he doing that? As opposed to something else. And it's like, you're living the principles. And when you live the principles, we grasp onto it and we see, and we say, oh, that's interesting. Why? What's going on? And we naturally ask questions. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, you know, you were on Joe Rogan and that's and the biggest platform in the world today, you, some might say. And so I'm curious what it was like to be on that, that platform more than once. I mean, you know, Joe is just a, a master of making it feel like you're not on the biggest platform <laughs> in the world and you're just chilling. So, and I, it was totally surreal. I, when I walked in there, he's like over on the side, just aggressively playing pool. <laughs> I'm like, it's like he's training, playing pool. Oh my God. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to let you finish training. I'm going to go, you know, take a piss. And um, yeah, I mean, he, he changed the game with regards to, like the thing that has struck with me, stuck with me listening to him for over the years is what you were saying before about like access to information and how it's expanding over time. And that's what long form podcasts are. It's just this, it's just more information. It's more dense and high res information, you know, kind of traditional media was these little sound bites and it was very kind of synthetic. And now we're getting into this 
hyper authentic long form world. And he's just a total pioneer on that. And so being able to like, I'm not, when I walked out of his studio and was just walking down the street to get a smoothie or something, I'm not kidding. Like two people walked up to me just from then. Oh my God. So it was like, you're broadcasting to like the whole city. Like half the people in the city are listening to the podcast. Cause that's when he used to do it live. He doesn't do them live anymore, but I mean, so much fun. And, you know, having someone who is a balanced, as balanced of a thinker as him be in that position, it makes perfect sense too. You know, some people are bitter. Some people think that, you know, have, have all these attacks on him and whatnot. But the reality is that he wouldn't be where he is if he wasn't a balanced thinker, trying to see both sides on every topic, playing devil's advocate with himself, play, play devil's advocate with me a little bit. And I like that. I yeah. like to, like, I want to play devil's advocate with myself and, you know, steel man, other people's arguments. But yeah, I mean, I, and, and it's just crazy since he started, like there's so many other, it, it shows that positive sum game. Mm-hmm situation too because there's just so many more shows that you know i listen to on a daily basis now that are like the exact same format and you just learn so much it's like i probably probably listen to like six hours of podcast a day wow what are some of your favorites um i really like i like lex a lot yeah. i really like tim dylan yeah he's hilarious it. oh my god i the comedy podcasts definitely keep me level-headed what else um been listening to a bunch of Mark Norman stuff recently. Yeah. Um, also, I like Tiger Belly. They're fun. Yeah. And what about you? I love Rogan, Lex. Modern Wisdom is a great podcast. Yep. Um, yep. Chris Williamson crushes it. Um, listen to Personal Trainer Podcast with my friends Mike Vacanti and uh, Jordan Syatt. They're incredible at just going back and forth. And My First Million is actually the sponsor of this podcast. It's a tech and business entrepreneurship podcast that I highly recommend as well. But um, before we get you out of here, I'm curious if we can give a challenge to people. I like to ask a challenge because I think a challenge lets people know they take the information and then they do something with it. So other than joining Minds, which I recommend people do and I signed up today, what a challenge that we can leave people with to live a better life? got to breathe more. Mm. I mean, that's, that's where I would go to at the base. Like, you know, even if you're just taking like 30 seconds or a minute a day to just, you know, breathe deep through the nose, everything's going to be okay. But, you know, beyond that to get a little bit more relevant to what we've been talking about, I would just say like, you know, with, with your phone, just feed things that you want to see succeed. Mm. And so like play around with some of these other apps and like, you know, for me, like a game changer that helped was just changing my default search, you know, like, cause you can go into your browser settings and make it DuckDuckGo. And like, I'm, I have no relationship with DuckDuckGo. Like I don't, I honestly, I would, they could do it better. A brave has their own search now as well, which is similar to DuckDuckGo. But like the point being like feed, it's like voting with your dollars, the same concept. Vote with your attention. Vote with your attention. And uh, it's, uh, it will, like, it does. I mean, stuff goes crazy viral just because of little micro moves like that. And um, I just feel like people get too complacent and comfortable. And, you know, I, I know, because I'm not innocent, like, I still check those apps. And it's like, it doesn't have to be to- cold turkey. Right. Like you can still stay in that world, but like step your foot into a little bit more of the world that, that you want to see. Bill Ottman, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.